Let us not forget everything that happens is by the will of a holy will. It's time to unite and say that we will be the best amongst men. It's not time to be extreme or to live in but to stand together. Followers streaming every day. Various platforms. Trust me, you'll find a way. Soon, the followers. Soon, the followers. Presenting volume two of Diluting Al Wala Wal Bara, part of the Right Belief series, the Unveiled Trilogy. Written by Sheikh Karim Abu Zaid. This book will focus on awakening the faith in a non faith centered world. Explained, broken down, and brought to you unlike before by Ustada Leila Nashiba. Join us Monday through Friday, 6 p.m. Eastern, right here on Sona Followers. Okay, now we've been speaking about the fitra for the past two weeks. How many of you Muslims understand what the fitra is? I've broken it down, I put shorts out. Who can tell me what is the fitra? Anyone? Okay, let's go for the track. Um, so the fitra is, um, well, let me start from the beginning. So when Allah created the soul of Adam, um, after his soul was created, he also created all the souls of his descendant of Adam from the time that Adam was created until the time, I mean, until the end of time. And so he gathered all those souls and he gathered them to the Mount Arafat and he had them to testify that there is no God but Allah and that um, he's the only one worthy of worship and the souls testified to that. And um, and then Allah had the souls kept in some place that only he knows of, that he chose to keep them in. And so when a person is conceived and at some point during that time of pregnancy, Allah would choose from like one of the souls, whatever souls he chose, and he'll, um, have, he'll have the angels place it in the woman's womb to assign it to that fetus. And then, um, Allah will assign an angel to care for that soul while it's in the womb. And once the soul is blown into the womb, there's this little light that was that was in the soul and it moves to the heart. So once the baby is born, that beam of light, which is what the fitra is, has moved to the heart. And now the soul comes out attached to a body with just clueless, doesn't know anything. And so it's kind of curious about its environment and just the things around it. And so because Allah created our souls to be criminal by nature, because it doesn't have that light in it anymore, it moves to the heart. Um, that's when, when a person reaches puberty, that's when Allah assigned an angel to the heart and a jinn to the soul to call, to try to call the soul to give into its desire and give into that evil nature, while as the angel will be there to call the heart to, you know, it's to its nature to want to seek out Allah and be in the presence of Allah and it has the ability to distinguish between right from wrong and good from evil because um that's where that feature is now is at the heart once we're here and that's what the feature is what do you guys think and this is one of my students she's been coming here since she was 12 years old what do y'all think about her answer what do y'all think about her answer she's a grown she woman now know. with babies She's a grown woman now, married with babies, but she's been coming here since she was 12. What do y'all think about her answer? What did you say? Who's on the mic? That was me. I said she hit it right on the money. Exactly. 
That's how you, what the fitra is. And for the rest of you who I keep asking every day, I ask this question every day, what is the fitra? And no one can give me the answer. Now that my student is back from her vacation, one of my students, she gave the answer, alhamdulillah. So now you guys see why English teachers, such as myself, why we get angry when we hear you guys butcher the English language by calling yourselves reverts. You are not a revert. You are an, a convert. Because when the word revert means to go back to your natural substance, for example, uh, if a solid, a rock, has uh if a rock has formed but originally it was a liquid but it formulated into a solid substance revert means to go back to that liquid substance to go back to the nature that you originally was composed or made of so when you got guys call yourselves reverts you're saying that you are a soul you're saying that you are reverting back to a soul. You're not a soul because now you're a soul and you are a human being. And the fitra is not a part of the soul anymore. Where is the fitra? Where's the fitra? Is the fitra part of the soul? No, it's in the heart. Exactly. The fitra is in the heart, as Sister Fabme detailed. So the word is not a revert, it's a convert. What does the English word convert mean? Convert means to take on a new ideology, a new way of life. The Hadith of the Prophet. Explain the Hadith of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he says that, uh, when he talks about the fitra, who can answer that and explain that Hadith now? And I don't want it to be family. She knows it. Explain the Hadith about children being born and then raised upon the, by their parents. Someone explain the meaning of that idea now that I broke down the English words of the meaning of fitra and where it came from, what it is. Who can explain that hadith now? That, ex that hadith is talking about how, how since children are all born upon the fitra, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was saying how it is the parents that shape Wait a minute, what does it mean to be born? You just skipped over it. What does it mean when the prophet says that children, because see y'all play the English Arabic. Don't use no Arabic. What does fitra mean again? What is a fitra? Now, tell me, what does the prophet mean when he, when he says children are born upon? Go ahead. Sorry, so they are born upon knowing that they're dependent on Allah, knowing that he is one. So they're dependent on him for food, for shelter, for warmth, because that's all they knew. Um, but, you know, as they grow older, it's their parents who start shaping them into different religions or different ideologies and what they were born with. There. Y'all see how when y'all use English, you don't speak Arabic. So you don't understand the meaning of those Arabic words. Y'all make like, like one another thing, what is it I had to correct so many Arabic people on for making fun of you? Because you don't understand that Witter, Tahajit, Qiyam are all talking about the different prayers made during the different times of night and Arabs make fun of you. Don't give people that reason to make fun of you. Know the meaning of those words. You know, Fitcher means we were born innocent because our souls are kept in that vault. So we already know, we, were, we testified to la ilaha illallah after Allah created Adam. My soul, your soul, we all testified to that. And we took on free will. He offered us free will, we were so stupid, we took it on. The rest of the creation besides the jinn refused it. Man and Jen were so stupid, we took on free will too. And we're going to talk about that a little later too. 
but the fitra means that embedded piece of light, that sliver of light that originally was in the soul that's now been transformed into my heart. It believes in a law. It knows that a law is the only one worthy of worship. And it craves to be in the, uh, t in the presence of a law because that's where it's been all its existence until a law put it in your, in, in your body. It's craving to be back up there with a law. Okay. But the parents, they raise us upon whatever ideology, whatever belief system that they're upon. And either that light of that, that recognizes and believes in Allah is dimmed or made brighter in that heart. And if it's dimmed, that's why human beings are always seeking what is their purpose. You're still searching for it. Even if you were raised as a witch, you were raised as a witch or a tree worshiper that little sliver of light in your heart is still searching for a law. Some people find it through Islam, other people don't. And the ones that don't, that little sliver of light becomes darker, darker, darker until it burns out. So you're not a revert. You're not reverting back to the human soul. You're a convert. For those of you who were not raised upon Islam, total submission, your fitra finds that connection with Allah and you convert to it, you embrace it. And that's why, <laughs> by the way, this was a question that somebody sent me today. One of the sisters wanna know why is it that it seems like the converts that she know, the converts that she know are stronger in their faith, that's why. You searched for it. You found that connection with Allah that you, your heart's been longing for. For many of us who were born and raised Muslim, we weren't raised correctly. We've taken Allah for granted. We've taken Islam for granted. We just Muslim in name only. My mom's Muslim, my dad, I come from a Muslim country, blah, blah, blah. But it, that's all, it's just something to say. But because you chose it, you chose Islam. Of course it means more to you than someone who took it for granted who's just going through the motions. So that's why you find a lot of people who convert to Islam are strong, much stronger than these born Muslims. I agree with you on that. You know, I deal with, um, uh, you'd be surprised how many born Muslims don't even know the basics of Islam. I don't get it. Those women and men y'all see protesting, many of them are Arabs, look at how they dress. Look at how they look. Can't tell if they are Muslim or not. Subhanallah. Allah. So mashallah, that's what the fitra is, the fitra. And like I say, I've been asking that question every day and you know, to, until you guys get it embedded in your mind what it is. It's that sliver of belief that was in the soul that has been transferred into your heart since Allah put you in the body that you are vesseled in. Hello. What happens in the grave? We went over that. Somebody's asking. We're going to talk about that again in this class too, later on. Not now, but much later, maybe a few months from now. Okay. When you're in your grave, what happens? The soul Either the soul is being punished in the hell fire or the soul will be in a green bird. But even though the soul is not within the body, the body will still feel everything. That's the answer for the brother that asked that question. He wants to know, Sister Layla, will the soul, will the body feel 
the hellfire if the soul is there. Yes, you will feel everything. Don't try to figure out how. Just know that Allah can do whatever he wants to do. Okay? So even though your soul and body will be separated, your body will be in that grave, your soul somewhere else, the body will feel everything. Every beating, every reprimation, everything. Everybody got that? Okay, good job, fam A, and welcome back, all right? Because all weekend, you should have heard the answers we were getting. Woo, Lord, on that question. Okay, so we've been speaking about how, as Muslims, we're supposed to uh, live each day of our lives trying to nourish the fitra, because the fitra is always craving Allah's attention, Allah's affection, Allah's approval, Allah's love. And the fitra has a little help because Allah has assigned all of us an angel. There's an angel assigned to everyone's heart when we reached puberty. And that angel tries to encourage you to do good things to listen to your heart. When we say listen to your heart, listen to the fitra. The fitra recognizes truth from falsehood, good from evil. And it's telling you, don't do that. Don't do that. But then we have the soul, which is criminal. As Allah says in the Quran, it is criminal by nature because the fitra has been removed from it. It doesn't have that fitra in it no more. So it's curious, it's attracted to everything bad, everything dirty, sex, drugs, rock and roll, music, okay? If it's dirty, if it's bad for you, the soul wants to taste it. I wanna taste it, I wanna try it, I wanna smell it, I wanna feel it. That's the soul. It's like a kid just curious, but the fitra keeps calling it away. And just as the fitra has that angel helping it, the soul has a little help too from the jinn. That evil jinn is assigned to us. He whispers into your heart because he knows your strengths and weaknesses. And he tries to get you to do what the soul wants to do. Wants to do. Wants to do. Sister Amina, Every human being that is born has a gen assigned to them. Religion has nothing to do with it. If you are a human being, once you get to the age of puberty, Allah will assign an angel to your heart and a gen to you. That's every human being on planet earth. It don't matter if you a Jew, a Christian, a pagan, a atheist, long as you are a human being. Does everybody understand that? Once every human being reaches puberty. All right. So either you're going to listen to the soul or you're going to listen to your heart. Either you're going to give in to the whispers of your gen or you're going to give in to the whispers of that angel. This is called jihad or nafs. And we're going to talk about that in another class a few months from now too. Okay. Uh, Sister Amina, what is the purpose of your gen? You've been in the classes here for 30 years. Why did Allah assign you that gen, Amina? You know this answer already. Tell me, why did Allah assign you a jinn? What's the purpose of that jinn, Amina? You should know that. You've been coming here for 30 years. Why you don't know that? Okay, any gen assigned to you guys, help her out. 
Is any gin assigned to you? Is he a friend? Is he good? What's his job? What's the job of your gin? That's assigned to us is basically to lead us to the hellfire by the by the gin whispering to us. It's like a test for us if we're gonna listen to it or not. So do you understand that? He ain't to test you. His job is to take you to hell. Have y'all seen the movie? Take me to hell. That's the job of your gin. Your gin is not a law. A law is the one who tests us, not a gin. A gin is evil. His job is to take you to hell so you can be his companion. That's his job. Allah put him there for that purpose to see if he can drag you to hell. Just like that movie, drag you to hell. By the way, the person that made that movie that wrote it was a Muslim. Turkish guy. <laughs> he likes to write books. That's just one of his books. But yeah, Turkish man wrote that movie. That's his job, to drag you to hell. Allah didn't put him there to be your friend. Who's your friend? Why would Allah give you two friends? Your friend is the angel. Everybody understand? Allah don't test you, no. That jinn's job is to take you to hell. If you listen to him. You understand? He ain't your friend. He's evil. He's an alia of shaitan. He's the ally of shaitan put there to drag you by your face to hell. If you stupid enough to listen to him. Because Allah is merciful. He didn't just give you that evil gin. He gave you that angel too. It's up to you to either listen to the jinn who's dragging you to hell or listen to the angel who's inspiring you to paradise. Your choice. See how merciful Allah is? Allah is so merciful to us. I give you two, a goodie and a baddie. The blue pill, the red pill. You pick your choice since you were simple enough to choose free will. When Allah created our souls, we chose free will. So since we chose it, you got an evil gin and you got a good friend. Who you listening to? Unfortunately, most of us listen to the gin because that's just how man is. We took on free will. We should have been like the, the, the sun and the moon. We should have been like the mountains and the cats and the dogs and said, no, we don't want it. But we took it. Yeah. Okay. So that's another topic. We are, I'm not going to spend all this time on the gin. I've talked about the gin so much to you guys that you shouldn't even ask about them no more. But anyway, the fitra, that's that fitra that has that angel calling you to the truth. That's what we're trying to focus on now. And we've been speaking about certain things that our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that if we uh, st stay clear of, it'll help to keep that fitra burning in our hearts. What are some of the things that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to do that will help to keep that fitra glowing. And remember, this is how merciful Allah is. Yeah, Allah gave us an evil jinn. That jinn is supposed to drag you to hell. But look how Allah made it. it. It would seem that most of us would be in paradise because not only did Allah tell us the things that'll take us to hell, 
Not only did he warn us what to stay away from, he also sent the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a guide to us. And the prophet Muhammad broke it down to us how to save our souls, how to resist that jinn. But we don't listen. What are some of the things the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us to stay clear of or to do that would help to keep that light bright that we've talked about so far. Go ahead, take the mic, people. Make thicker, consistent thicker, keeping our mouths moist with remembrance of Allah. Okay, that's one of the things the prophet told us to do, to remember Allah as much as we can. Because that's one thing too, the jinn, that evil jinn that's assigned to your heart, that whispers to your soul, he ain't as strong as we make him out to be. All you got to do is say the word Allah and he'll go sit down. So that's why we say Masha Allah. That's why we say Supana Allah. That's why we say Astaghfirullah. Keep our tongue moist with remembrance of Allah. That'll make that little jinn go sit down at least for a minute. He'll come back, but at least you get a minute's break. What else did the, did the prophet teach us to do that can help keep that light burning in our heart? To yeah. obey everything that he commanded us to obey, amen? Okay, to obey a lot. Of, yes, okay, but that's easier said than keep done. Keep good company. Okay, keep yeah. surround yourself around good that's company. That's what I want to hear. practicing Muslims. Uh, yeah, I want to mm -hmm. hear what the prophet told us to do. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also said, surround yourself with righteous people. Be careful of the company you keep. Surround yourself with Muslims. Wala walbara. Distance yourself from that which contradicts Allah and his laws. Distance yourself from that which uh, imposes upon our morality. So good company is very important. Who we choose to be with. Layla don't hang with no weak people. I keep telling y'all weak Muslims can't hang with Layla. All the sisters that's close to me, I ain't got but two friends. Latifa, she's deadly. We done punched a lot of dudes in the nose and broke their noses, me and Tiba. <laughs> and Aisha, by the way, Aisha's the president of care now. My other friend, she's the president of care. <laughs> so I don't hang around with weak people. All right, what else did the prophet tell us to do? Seek forgiveness and seek before we get to all of that stuff, what did he tell us? Listen to the question. The prophet told us there are some things. We didn't talk about forgiveness. The prophet said there are some things that we can do that will keep the light of that fitra burning. Number one, remember Allah. Number two, surround yourself with good people. What else did we talk about? Seeking knowledge. <laughs> yes, that's the number one. Yes, the prophet said always uh, seek knowledge of Allah. The more we know about Allah, the closer we become to him. Okay, what else did we talk about? Giving charity, do good deeds. We didn't talk about that. Oh, I thought we was talking about in charity. Oh. Y'all missing the main thing. Listen again. Oh, what? Sorry. Things that we can do that will keep the light shining. Number one, seek knowledge of the religion. Number two, remember Allah as often as we can. Number three, choose good people to surround yourself with. What's the fourth thing? Performing religious rites and rituals. No, not really. Y'all missing the, the fourth one. Good company and good what? It's real important. We spent three days talking about it. Your environment. Environment. Why come y'all can't get that? 
So that's what's important. What's important? The prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, number one, seek the proper knowledge of Islam. Learn the religion correctly. Understand what la means, what it entails, because that's what's going to be your source of strength, even when times are hard. So seek knowledge on a regular basis. Number two, surround yourself with righteous people. That's why it's important to have a strong Islamic community behind you. Remember, we're living in a non-Muslim environment. We're living in a secular environment, community. A strong Muslim community is everything. Number three, environment. Make sure that the environment is good, the prophet taught us. You know, you don't want to be in an environment like drugs and sex and all of that. That's going to dim your light. Okay, those are the top things, guys. The top things, the top four things that the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us to do. Those four things. That's wala wa bara. Our allegiance is to Allah, to the prophet, to each other for a reason. Because as the prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the biggest weapon that we have against shaitan is each other. Because we remind each other. We encourage each other. We support each other. And then we distance ourselves from any ideology, any lifestyle, any way other than the way of Allah. Everybody understand that. That's how we keep that light burning. Okay, so today what I'm going to do, let me put the PowerPoint up. I did post up for you guys to read pages 47 through 49 because that's what we're going to focus in on today. And let me put this uh, PowerPoint up. And again, I want you guys to take uh, screenshots. What is this? Uh, oh, can y'all see that? This is Twitter. Is that Twitter? Okay. For the people in Zoom, I'm sharing you guys to Twitter. But for everybody else, let me put you to my PowerPoint right here. Here it is. Oh, let me put everything down too. I sat down. Okay, wait, let me do all this. And by the way, guys, please support us. We need donations to cover our website expenses, man. Oh my God, we're getting ready to go under again. Would it be? It's just this website is so stressful. Okay, hold on. Hold on, let me do this. Oh, oh, there it is. Now I'm gonna make a big screen. And when I put the whole PowerPoint up, guys, make sure y'all take screenshots and print it out, staple it together, attach it to page 47 of your books, okay? Because this is where we'll be picking up today. And again, the this is the red peel, the red book. This is volume two. This is over 500 pages long. We just completed volume one. It took us over a year. That was the blue book. This is the red peel, the red book, which focuses in on how to keep your faith alive in a non-faith field environment. Okay. That's why all of this has to do with keeping that fitra, that fitra burning and uh, this uh, um, non-Islamic society that we live in. And today we're going to speak about Allah and his guidance. Now, one of the questions that uh, one of the sisters asked the other day was about the divine law. Whenever we use, you hear the English word divine, it refers to God, which in our way, uh, religion is Allah, because it's not God. 
Allah is more than that. The divine laws are the laws of Allah. The divine guidance is the guidance that Allah sends. And that's different than secular law. Secular law refers to non-religion. Divine laws refers to religion. And we're gonna talk about it. You'll get to see how America and most other parts of the world are Zionists because these countries are not based on divine law. You look at the history of America. Why did America break away from England? Why did the Paul Revere and the settlers, those settlers break away the, uh, from the, the colonists break away from England? Because England wanted to establish divine law in America. England was a monarchy and it, they wanted to impose divine laws of Christianity. Paul Revere, George Washington, Jefferson, and all of them were opposed to that. They did not want to be governed by religious law. They wanted to be governed by the laws that they made, which in English is called secular laws. Secular laws are man's laws. They wanted to formulate their own constitution based on what they define liberty and justice to be, not based on the Bible, not based on any, and that's, and by the way, I'm a paralegal. This is part of the constitution. You're saying that if you read the constitution, they're saying that. We don't want the laws of God. We don't want the laws of anyone except the laws that we make. George Washington was a Mason. Thomas Jefferson was a Mason. Paul Revere were Masons. What are Masons? Masons are Zionists. They are opposed to monarchy and they are opposed to div divinity. They're all about secularism. You learn that when you go to school and get a degree in history, okay? So America was, was a Zionist country, always has been. It broke off from England. It didn't want to be governed by religious law. It didn't want to be governed by a law, God. It wanted to make its own laws and it's still the same way. All your American presidents are Zionists. They, they swear to uphold that. That's why you American Muslims should never, ever have been voting in an election. Obama is a Zionist. All presidents are. I think except for, I'm gonna be honest, I don't think Clinton was a Zionist. I think Clinton was just uh, an example of America. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll, baby. But all the other presidents are Zionists. That's why you should never participate in no elections here. Y'all didn't know that? I knew it. I was born in the USA and never voted and never will. Because I know what Zionism is. So this is what happens. When we, uh, uh, instead of us following the divine laws, and the divine guidance, which are the laws of Allah and the guidance of Allah, it ends up in chaos. And that's what these pages focuses on. And this is what Sheikh Karim Abuzay talks about in these pages here. And I ended to help y'all to understand what's happening in the world a little better too. Let's open it up and look. Okay. In a secular society, which is America, which is the United Kingdom, which is Canada, which is most European countries, it's Australia. In a secular society where religion is not the forefront, it's common to distort 
the fundamental aspects of religion. Again, that's America's constitution, indivisible with liberty and justice as, and, 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 and justice for all. It ain't about no God. It ain't about no what God said. It's all about doing what you want to do, a democracy. And by the way, Islam is not a democracy. We don't believe in a democracy. That's another reason why you shouldn't have been voting in no elections. Y'all were listening to those brothers down there in Texas and stuff telling y'all to vote. What does the law say about a democracy? We ain't no democracy. This ain't no pick and choose and the majority rule. We should have been doing better. When you come to America seeking that uh, green card, seeking that life of goodness, understand you have to do better. Well and well better. You have to distance yourself from those things that contradict our way of life. But instead of doing that, you people gave in to it. You become westernized. You've allowed the secular society to distort your principles of faith. And those principles of faith are, are crucial to the spiritual well-being of yourself. They're crucial to the spiritual well-being of your children. Your Islamic ideology becomes distorted. You end up questioning the existence of a law. You end up questioning his laws, his rules. That's why your children are not wearing hijabs. That's why your daughters are not wearing a bias. Your boys don't have beards. They got dreadlocks. This is what happens when you come to a secular society in which religion is not the forefront. You question your beliefs and you fail to acknowledge that there is a day of judgment. So as Muslims, it's necessary to address the challenges that we have to face living in secular societies just to preserve our belief and to nurture our fitra. It's hard to nurture your fitra in a secular world. And unfortunately, guys, most of the world is secular, even the Arabic world. I'm not going to be deluded. You will go to Saudi Arabia and see that it's distorted there too. You can go to the Emirates and see it's a secular society too. Don't be twisted. Okay? So by recognizing and understanding the challenges that come with living in a secular world, we can better navigate through the hardships that we face in regards to our religion. But the problem is most Muslims don't recognize the challenges. Most Muslims don't understand the challenges. Why? Because they don't understand their religion anymore. They don't understand what Wala well, well better is. They think a person like Layla Nashiba, a person like Sheikh Kareem Abu Zayd, a person like Sheikh uh, Muhammad Saeed Atli, a person like Dr. Ibrahim Jamali, a person like Sheikh Mustafa Morsi, they look at us and think that we're extremists, that we're fanatics. We're, what's the term they called me the other day? We're pseudo Salafi. That's the new term I heard. Pseudo Salafi, because we are trying to, you know, remind you of the complexities that we have to deal with living in a, a non-religious environment, okay? So the concept of Allah's law and the concept of Allah himself 
In this type of environment, these environments of secularism or Zionism, that's another word for Zionism, the people try to stomp out belief in the law. They don't want you to uphold any religious principles. As the American Constitution says, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Justice for, whereas a man can lay with another man, a woman can marry another woman. You can even marry your pet dog. We got people in America who are marrying their pet animals, their pet dog, their pet cat. Liberty and justice, no divine laws, no, uh, no barrier, nothing. Everything is just do as you want. So whenever we live in a society like that, the laws of a law become eroded and the people are discouraged from embracing the guidance of a law in their daily lives. You're discouraged from wearing a hijab. They try to tell your daughters that your daughters are oppressed because they have a hijab and an abaya on. That isn't it free? Isn't it better to show your body parts? Your sons are discouraged from combing their hair and wearing thobes and beards and instead told to let it grow like a dreadlock and then wear their pants underneath their dairy ears. Okay? So by sowing the seeds of doubt, these secular societies undermine the foundations of our faith and they lead us to detach from that spiritual connection with the law, to detach from that moral guidance where a law made Eve, not Steve, a law made Adam, not Havana. Okay. They distort Allah's names and attributes in their pursuit to negate his essence. The people in secular societies, they liken Allah to his created, to his creation, blurring the line between Allah and his creation. And this leads to ridicule and mockery of Allah. You turn on TV. One of the things I hated about that country that hosted the Olympics, Qatar, they had that black actor and I can't stand him. Look at him now, he's all broke down. That black actor, he's a witch. He'll tell you he doesn't believe in God. In fact, he played the role of God. That was his sitcom. He played God a lot. And they had him in Qatar with that speech he gave to that little, it was just ridiculous. I saw through it. The people of knowledge, we can see through all that garbage. Look at him now. He all broke down. I heard he fighting for his life. Allah don't like that. Allah don't like you to come and try to liken yourself to him. He's a witch and been likening himself to a law playing God in that TV series for years. And now you sitting in a Muslim country while somebody is reciting the Quran, making your, your ridicule of it. Look at him now, broke down. Muslims today, we allow these type of environments to destroy our faith diminish our belief to the point where we don't know the names of Allah. We don't know the attributes of Allah. We can't break them down. I got a class I teach once a week. Y'all struggling with it. You're struggling. You're getting better, alhamdulillah. But you don't know the meaning of those names of Allah. You can't apply them to yourself or to your interaction with others. And as our prophet Muhammad said, until we understand those names of Allah and implement them in our life, you will never be a true believer. Subhanallah. 
So I want y'all to understand that's the goal of a secular society, which is a Zionist society. The goal of Zionism is to weaken the impact of religion from the hearts of the people and to distance the people away from a law, away from morality, and instead to adapt the ideology of man's laws, man's occupation. Man wants to occupy the earth and establish his own rules, his own laws. That's always been the desire. That was what America was founded on, okay? That's what Australia's founded on, Canada, most European countries, not just Hitler's, Zionism. Get away from Allah and belief in him and instead adapt belief in man. But we need Allah's guidance. In a secular society, there may be attempts to minimize the values and teachings of a law's guidance. That's why you find people making attacks on religious scriptures. That's why you find people taking the verses of the Quran, misconstruing the meaning of them. We even got so-called Muslims doing that. We got Muslims now telling you that it's lawful to smoke marijuana. They're taking the verses of the Quran and misconstruing the meaning. We got people who call themselves Muslims telling you that it's okay to have slaves when there are no slaves right now. It's okay to take a woman as a right hand possession when that ain't happening. We ain't in no war. So unfortunately, we're faced with this, this secularism, this Zionism, even in the Muslim populated world. This is one of the signs of the last hour. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Islam will become strange. The Sunnah will become abandoned, forgotten. The people will issue fatwa that goes against what Allah says, that goes against what the prophet said. They will adopt their own ideology and the other people will be stupid enough to follow them in that. We need Allah's guidance because Allah doesn't make mistakes. All of Allah's laws are for our betterment. All of his obligations are for our betterment. Man makes mistakes, Subhana Allah, okay? And one of the number one reasons why so many of us Muslims fall victim to Zionism or secularism is because we really don't believe in the day of judgment. We really don't understand that we are held accountable for our choices in this world. When Allah created the soul and had the soul testify to him on Arafat, he also offered us free will. We took it on. And since we accepted free will, that means that we are held accountable for our choices in life. But unfortunately, a lot of us live each day as if we're going to live forever. We give in to our soul. We ignore the urgings of the fitra. And instead, we give in to the criminality of the soul thinking that we're not going to be held accountable, thinking that we won't be raised up again, thinking that that day of judgment will never come. And whenever judgment is removed or downplayed, that's when we lose our sense of accountability. 
And when we lack accountability, that's when our sense of personal, social, and civil responsibility diminishes too. It makes us feel justified in giving in to our desires. It makes us uh, uh, feel uh, that it's okay to do what makes us feel good. And without belief in a higher authority to hold us accountable, it makes us give in to the temptations of self-interest and short-term gains, ignoring the repercussions. So in, in other words, we lack accountability. And as a result of that, we destroy ourselves and also society falls too. That's why American society is the way it is. That's why Western society is the way it is. It's because it's not based on divine law. It's not based on divine guidance. It's based on what man thinks to be good. So, It's hard to maintain our faith, guys. All of you listening to me are living in societies in which religion has been downplayed. So the chances of us giving in to our soul instead of the fitra is great as a result. So now let me give you a quiz to see just how well you understood what I talked about today. And this is a, a deep topic. That's why I only took those first, those, those two pages to explain to you. Let's see how well you can answer this question. Question number one, who can explain what is the difference between divine law and secular law? And I would like the answer to come from Jamila. Sister Jamila, if somebody can look on uh, YouTube, is Jamila on YouTube? Because this is a question that Jamila asked the other day. She wanted to know what's the difference? What is divine law? I want to see if she understands what it is. Is Jamila there, Fame? No, I don't see her. Okay. Okay, so anyone else can take the mic then. What is the difference between divine law and secular law? Divine law is laws that Allah established and they have no mistakes because he knows what is best for his creation. Secular laws are um, laws that are non-religious and man-made. So, you know, they fall into democracy and they kind of misconstrue the meaning of freedom and liberty. They put their own twist on it. Oh, wow. What do you guys think about her answer? I agree. I Good agree. job. That's Was that crazy. Aya? Is that Aya answering? Yeah. Good job. You sound like your mother. MashaAllah. May Allah forgive her of her sins and make her great spacious. I mean, I mean. Good. Excellent answer. Exactly. Divine laws are the laws of Allah. Secular law are the laws of man. Good job. What about this question? Wait a minute. Okay, here it is. How does a sense of accountability impact one's choices or decisions? How does having a sense of accountability impact the choices you make or the decisions you make? Having a sense of accountability um, will, will cause you to make positive um, choices and decisions based on the, um, not the results, but based on the outcome that may come about, like, you know, um, the punishment that might come about for you doing an action that is bad. So you might choose to stray away or not do it, but, you know, follow the positive because you fear the punishment of it. What do you guys think about her answer? I agree. 
Good job. Mm -hmm. Exactly. If you have a sense of accountability, you're going to be more cautious, more cautious with the choices you make. You know, more cautious, just like today. Let me use myself as an example. My granddaughter came over. Y'all know the little bad one, by the way, the bad one getting ready to wear hijab. Can y'all believe it? <laughs> See what happens when you throw them out? Now she all about hijab, Jill Bab, and, you know, it's all about the dean. You know, she coming here talking about the dean. Oh, alhamdulillah. But then, you know, after she left, I said, well, why don't I go out to the, you know, take myself out to eat you know just go out I mean, you know i'm a single woman i ain't got no no time clock to punch i said let me just take myself out to lunch i'm gonna go up here to uh used to be one of my favorite restaurants fridays got in my in her car because she took mine got in her car drove to the restaurant got out the car some little young bloods, y'all know it. Italian stallions drove up in a little sports car, little BMW, looking like my friend Aisha's car. Got out their little sports car. Oh, ma'am, you look so nice today. I said, oh, thank you. It's time to go home. Got in my car and drove all the way back home. I didn't go to lunch. I came home and, came and started doing my internet stuff. You're gonna make better choices. I said, now I can go in that restaurant. Those two little young Italian stallion men, you know, they might want me, they might invite me to come sit down with them. Maybe want to buy me a virgin strawberry daiquiri. You never know. I took myself home. And my granddaughter told me I was crazy when I told her. She said, come on, you so crazy. But, you know, I'm afraid. Seriously, guys, y'all know I got anxiety. You never know. I don't want to get caught up in no crap. You know, somebody tell me I look nice and they a young Italian stallion. Layla's out of there. Do you hear me? Because I know I look nice, but Lord have mercy, I'm a woman. You old enough to be my great great grandson. I'm out of there. Subhanallah. So again, a sense of accountability will cause you to make better choices for yourself. My home is better than me, guys. I don't go out nowhere. I'll just door dash. If I want some Friday steak, I'll door dash it and just eat here with my little cat, you know, subhanAllah. Allah. So it'll make you make better choices and decisions. All right. You so have answers on that from YouTube. Um, Sister Sakina said a sense of accountability will make you consider the punishment before making choices in our life. And um, Sister Jamila just came in and she said, we are responsible for our, our action and our choice. We make it, we make in life. So we, so, um, so don't be easy, be misled. Good job. Sister Jamila's here, right?